And may that song be the blessing that you receive for those here today to feel the physical healing, the mental healing, the spiritual healing. May every cell in your body be blessed with that beautiful song from their hearts into your bodies. Thank you, Dalton, what a beautiful, so wonderful to have you back. You color up the place, sir. <laughs> you just look so professional over there. So um, we're talking about finding meaning and finishing this month talking from the, some of the thoughts from authentic happiness and a lot of th talk this week about happiness, optimism, um, how pessimism gets in our way a little bit. And so I have the, the joy to, to speak to how do we find meaning? How do we find meaning in life? And oftentimes, you might have even witnessed that where a friend has come to you, I don't know my purpose. Um, I know Reverend Mary and I and practitioners hear that a lot, you know, I, I don't know what the meaning is behind this. And, and a lot of our prayer work is to reveal the source of all that there is. And we usually are going back to the place of love. So overall, the meaning of everything, so we can just relax in the knowing is love, is absolutely love. But what gets in the way is all our beliefs and our conversations about, about that. And then suddenly we're in our duality mind and suddenly we are separating things out and questioning and wondering and suffering. So I'm, I want to share something from a rabbi um, from spiritual, spirituality and health, Rabbi Rami Shapiro. But he, he says one of these uh, questions came to him, I believe there is someone outside the universe, someone I call God, who created the universe and judges the behavior of everyone in it. I feel sorry for you that you don't. Why do you reject my beliefs? His answer, I don't reject them. I simply don't hold them. <laughs> Please don't take this personally. I do my best to avoid belief altogether. Beliefs are ideas we hold to be true without demanding evidence to prove that they are true. I like evidence. Beliefs can provide answers. I prefer questions. Beliefs offer a certainty. I embrace uncertainty. Beliefs come from authorities. I want to investigate what it is for myself. There is no need to feel sorry for me. After all, what if your beliefs are wrong? Just kidding. <laughs> they can't be wrong. That's why we call them beliefs. <laughs> I think he's just so dang witty. And, and yet, he's right on. He's right on target for, for so many of things that, that he has responses for. So as we, the, the reading, what I particularly like about the reading of Ernest Holmes in the sharing of the prodigal son is, and when he came to himself. That is, a, sometimes scripture can be um, kind of overwhelming and you look at it and it just kind of washes over you and you might feel like, well, that kind of hung together pretty well. You take a phrase and you sit with it and you contemplate it and you deepen with it. And he came, and when he came to himself, the great awakening, the great awakening, the great moment where one, each one of us, does our own soul searching and finds our answer. We find our aha. We find our sanctuary of truth. We find that greater love. No authority, no constant reading or studying is going to provide that. It's the moment you awaken, that great awakening, when you come into yourself and it is known through intuition and through that grace. So that led me to look at Viktor Frankl's work, who wrote the uh, Search for Meaning. And as some of you recall who Viktor Frankl is, he was uh, the pris one of the prisoners in the Holocaust uh, time period. And with his um, stamina and his convictions, he 
uh, survived that horror. And he used that experience to awaken himself. And when he was awakened himself, he was able to share some of these ideas with all of us. And he became um, a very wonderful uh, psychologist in the way of inviting people to look deeply into what is. Now, a little bit at 9 o'clock, I shared the, the idea of optimism. And uh, Emma Curtis Hopkins is one of the teachers of Ernest Holmes. And there's a phrase that she said, it's all good. It's all good. And so sometimes we pick up the phrases and we're saying it's all good and that's a very annoying when you're in a situation that doesn't feel so good and you have uh, somebody feeding that to you and you can feel a little bit of a contraction going on like, well, I know, but I'm not there right now. So let me share a little bit about why it's important. The word good is a prayer in itself. The word good is a prayer in itself because it transforms the negative into what is unfolding here is something good. And maybe we can't see it. Viktor Frankl described it as a movie with different scenes going along the way. Each scene has its own story. Each scene has its own emotion. And we can follow that screen by screen and get stuck in some of them put it on pause and just go, oh, this is happening. How can this be good? What is good about this? You know, and we can see it in our world today. What is good about some of the, the shootings and the horrific storms and the loss that people are experiencing, the crashes? What, you know, we can't just turn to somebody and just as they're suffering and say, it's all good. You know, it just, it stops people and takes them back. But the experience, and this is what Viktor Frankl discovered. The experience is already over. And yes, we pour compassion and love and heart into that and we bring it forward. We embrace it. We don't turn from it. We walk into it and serve. We find a way that it speaks to our heart and what can I do? This is horrific. What can I do? And when we realize we can place that optimistic thought of good and love and, and bless it in that way, then those are our motivations to walk into that light and allow that good to follow us as we declare that word into the power of the one and know that a good is unfolding here. If we look at any tragedy, whatever you name it, in your personal ones and in the global ones, you take those and you find your way and you find a way that you can make it better. You find a way that you can learn. You find a way that you become the strength for another that suddenly finds themselves in that walk of life. This everything good is what Viktor Frankl's saying as well, is an affirmative language that we turn to as we use the creative power of the one. So in his search for meaning, he says that there, there is part of the life experience, he calls it the tragic triad, the human experience of pain, guilt, and death. He he, those are the tragic triad, triads. And he said the challenge for us, the opportunity for us, is to use tragic optimism in the face of those tragedies. You turn the suffering into human achievement of accomplishment. You derive from the guilt the opportunity to change oneself for the better. Let me pause on that one. He pointed out that in his research, when he was in his profession, he found that for the prisoners, no one ever asked them their side of the story. And I, I kept rereading that thinking, I never thought of that. You know, usually we're pointing the finger of blame and ready to have them um, serve their time or serve a sentence of uh, repentance. But I thought, have we ever listened to their story? And so he gave the prisoners an opportunity to tell their story. When they were heard, when they were heard, they had their awakening. 
they had their moment when they came to themselves. They were able to articulate how much they wanted forgiveness, how much they were sorry for what they'd done, and in such a genuine, deep way, they were listened to and they were heard. So deriving from the guilt, the opportunity to change oneself for the better. Deriving from life's transitoriness, an incentive to take responsible action. This is a time for social spiritual action. It is a time that we don't just sit back and say it's all good and then do nothing, but we turn to the conditions and we find a way, every single one of us, a way that we can offer our heart because the one love holds it all. The one love is greater than any tragedy. And so we lift ourselves to that. We just went through uh, honoring the 9-11. And I think about, back to that day, I think about the horror of people falling from the buildings. But what I saw that always grasps my heart and puts me in tears is people, as they fell, reached for one another so they could embrace one another as they met their fate. And I thought, look what love did. Love drew them magnetically together, and they held each other. And then we don't know the rest of the story. There's then afterlife, if you believe in that, now what is happening there? What is unfolding there? Theirs to know, ours to wonder, the mystery, all love, all reaching out, all embracing, deriving from life's transitoriness and incentive to take responsible action. And this idea of being optimistic, it's not any kind of a Pollyanna annoying thing. It's more of just sitting in your heart, doing your practice and, and getting yourself deeply connected to what you know, what you intuitively know that is God's design for this world. And that is love unfolding. That is service to one another. That is simply reaching out. And how can I help you? How can I be of service here? You lost your beloved, how can I hold you? You lost your child, how can I hold you? Your sister's in a coma, how can I hold you? How can I help you? How can I serve you? It's a continual question to the self, to awaken the self to that greater idea. So he says, optimism is not commanded or ordered. We cannot be ordered to be happy. We ourselves take that journey to discover a reason to be happy. He said, honestly, there is a meaning to be sought in every experience, the good ones, the challenging ones. It's inherent. It can be dormant in a situation. It is ours to take it to our heart, to take it to the seat of love. And he says something sort of clever. He says, just saying cheese doesn't make you happy in the photo. Those are all artificial smiles. So it so makes me want to go back to my yearbooks. Artificial, artificial. I knew it. I knew. I knew. Because there's the, the genuine, the genuine laugh, the genuine smile that every, it just carries everybody into it. We've spoken of that. Saying cheese doesn't make you happy. So we're all seeking meaning to everything that's going on in our experience. We're pausing sometimes the movie frames of our own life and not allowing the screenplay to play itself out so that we see the happy ending. We're pausing it and then we're setting up a, a state of anxiety because there's something great unknown happening here. There's no meaning. How can this happen? Why is this happening to me? Well, if you lost your beloved, maybe there's some really cool person down the way. If you keep reading, you're going to find that. Let go. Let that person be free. And you be free to find that greater good that's unfolding and longing to be in your life. The actualized person, the actualized person recognizes the moments of aha, the moments of this vast knowledge, this moment of a belief, kind of differing a little bit from the rabbi there, but a belief that establishes you into a faith of knowing, yes, it is all good unfolding. 
because I believe in the divine love. I believe in my service to that one. In the logotherapy, which Viktor Frankl was a part of developing, he says, find meaning. Do the work before you. Do what's called for you to do. Experience something. Encounter someone. Encounter love. So if you're seeing the sorrow and the heartbreak, find the love. Find the love there. Rise above yourself, even in the most hopeless of situations. Rise above and face the fate. He found that with great dignity, some of those uh, prisoners that he was rooming with, they gave up in that moment. He knew when they gave up and they had to go to the gas chamber. But when they did, they did it with dignity. They stood tall and they did the walk. It was their last moment of grace that they allowed to fill their spirit. So they rose above themselves into a field of a greater love that you say, walk with me. May the divine, may this love walk with me through this time, through this hopeless situation as I face this fate that I cannot change, rise above and turn this personal tragedy into a triumph. Not easy, heavy hearted even to talk about it. But when we see it, we know it. It allows our heart to open, not contract. To open to the vast way that love expresses itself through each and every one of us. We can decide moment by moment not to be bothered by something happening to us. Or we can choose our attitude and we can overcome. We can overcome guilt sorrow by rising above and awakening ourselves. He also says in his closing of, this, of the very last words of his beautiful work, and if you haven't read it, it's a wonderful uh, journey into trying to understand something of the past and it's relevant to every moment today. He said, um, powerful, so let us be alert, alert in a twofold sense. Since Auschwitz, we know what man is capable of. Since Hiroshima, we know what is at stake. Oh, I breathe with that as we continue in the many ways that, that war and uh, confusion disrupt the sense of our wholeness with the divine. But let us look in his, in his wisdom. Let's look at someone that was in that walk and discover how can I be that strength? Who am I in this story? So there's um, five, five different ways to find this meaning in your life. And one of them will surprise you. It's stop playing by all the rules. You know, sometimes you can be so confined, so restricted by all the rules in life, you never find that freedom to do it your way. You are given a life, an individualized expression of the one. You are empowered and you have an intuitive connection to that divine grace to empower you. And so you discover what has been my passion all my life all my life, what has been my passion? What have I found myself since I was a small, small child caring for? I look at myself, I think back, I, I've created all these little tiny ant farms and I put corrals around them like as if they knew what that meant. But I was trying to make them safe so nobody would step on them. And they stung me like crazy, but I still, I loved those ants. I loved stink bugs, but this was a passion. Now you're my ants and my stink bugs. <laughs> and I'm still trying to corral and take care of you and, and love you. But, I, but this passion stayed with me my whole life. My nursing career, all of it was a calling. How can I serve? It doesn't make me greater than anyone else, but I feel deeply satisfied that I dabble in this space of love. The other uh, point here is step out of your comfort zone. Fear of the unknown, fear of failing, fear of not being in control, 
Those moments confine you, they don't define you. So you allow yourself to say, I'm gonna just see what it's like to step out of my comfort zone. I was talking to, to Kim in a, a moments before the service and, and she's taking dance lessons and I'm like, oh, I wanna take dance lessons. Charlie and I just do this because it's safe and we won't step, he won't step on my sore feet. But I wanna dance like they dance, like I know I can dance. And it's stepping out of the comfort zone. It's finding a way to go do it. The other one was finding your joy. What does make you happy in life? Follow that joy. If you love to travel, go travel. If you love your family, go be with them. If you don't, don't go. So these ideas of, of continually to fi say, find my joy. Oh, but I have to fill in the blank. No, you don't. Find another way. Find a way with love. Listen to your intuition. That's number four. Listen to those gut instincts. Listen to the divine speaking so sweetly to you and saying, here, here, my beloved, go this way. Go this way today. You have to be somewhere at a certain time. Take a pause, close your eyes, rest your feet. You know, there's just so many times we make our choices and we put the intuition in the back seat. I think Damien, you spent this whole week living through your intuition. He celebrated his birthday week like nobody else I've ever seen. He's up on a mountain, he's in front of, you know, Amethyst Angel Wings. He's, he's living his life. He's getting outside of boundaries and finding his joy. And the fifth one, which you can all relate to, is appreciate those individual sacred moments when you feel the aha stirring. Don't stifle it. That is your awakening. That is the parable. That is when you come back to yourself, it's only by means of you that you can dance with that spirit of love. Amen. I'm going to have Judy come forward and we'll do a, a, a sweet blessing on these words. There's more to share about meaning. We'll continue the conversation. But this is a good day to feel that we are complete. And I share with you as we're studying the Tao, I loved this particular uh, passage from the Tao. The freedom of enlightenment is impossible to describe. We can only notice how it appears in action, in service. We pay complete attention to whatever we are doing. As if we were crossing a river on ice-covered stones, we are alert to everything that happens, like a bird watching in all directions. We have a quiet dignity and reserve, like a guest who does not seek attention. Our judgments and opinions melt away like ice in the summer heat. There is a beautiful simplicity about us, like a gem before it's shaped and polished. We welcome whatever comes. We welcome whatever comes as a valley welcomes the river. To notice this enlightenment, we sit patiently. We wait, here's my favorite line, for the muddy thoughts to settle, our mind to become clear. Life then lives itself in us. And I add to that, love then lives itself in us. Practicing this path, we no longer worry about what we have or don't have because we have everything. We really have everything. Love is all there is. So join with me as you, you close your eyes. You welcome the intuitive grace of love flowing effortlessly through you. Yes, the muddy waters of thought have settled. There is pristine clarity that love is all there is. And as we open our arms to the great mystery, to the Divine Mother, to the Holy Father, we recognize the holiness of all that there is. And it is ours to name it, to transform it, to work with it, 
to serve from that place of greater understanding. For this I give thanks. For this is what this center is about, learning to serve one another from a place of grace, humility, and love. So I give thanks. I give thanks for all that I witnessed this week the tirelessness of the men and the women and the children that walked through our parking lot and our sanctuary and found what they need, what they wanted, how they could serve. It was a combination of humanity just being, and we held it, all of us held it in a place of love. For that, I give thanks. Now the prosperity flows through and we continue to give back. How good is that? I say thank you, God, for the holy, holy way. Thank you, God, for the holy, holy way. And so it is. <laughs>